Well, you may be seated. Welcome to HBF, and thank you for praising the Lord Jesus and being a great choir this morning. And it is good to see you. Uh, I tell you what, uh, after seeing everybody in the lobby, I thought we were going to have 500 people here this morning. It seemed like I saw everybody out there today, so praise the Lord. It's good to be at church on Sunday morning. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, we are glad that you are with us electronically. We'd love to have you here physically, if at all possible. And uh, we'd love to see you here at HBF as soon as possible, if at all possible. If you have your Bibles, we turn to the book of Acts, chapter 17. We've been covering this uh, study in the book of Acts. Of course, the first 12 chapters, we talked about how uh, a few faithful men were used of God to really uh, incredibly ignite the world uh, with the gospel. But now we're getting to the, the verses, uh, or chapters 13 through the end of the book of Acts, and we've talked about how we're discovering our DNA, how the, the very things that we see in the transition from the 12 apostles to the apostle Paul and the gospel of God going to the Gentiles is, is really found in the DNA of our local New Testament church. And it's very exciting to see uh, the text that we're going to have the, the next several weeks in the book of Acts chapter 17. So I just want to just want to make sure that uh, if you don't have a Bible uh, in the seat rack in front of you, you can grab a Bible that uh, has been prepared here at HBF and turn to page 853. That should put you in Acts chapter 17. And so it is May. I think I saw Riley. Riley, it's good to see Riley. And then uh, I know Emily Preisendorf, Robin Preisendorf, you guys graduated from college. So uh, we had, we have any other graduates in the house from college? We've had, uh, yeah, go ahead. Give him some, give him some love. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. We always recognize high school, of course, but we often, uh, we often, uh, you know, college, they're often gone. So, you know, out of sight, out of mind. So it's good to have Riley and, and any others though. I just don't want to miss anyone else. Okay. I know uh, as we spread out as a family and get older, there's often, uh, you know, graduations. They don't always occur, especially in college, they don't always occur even in May. So, uh, you know, we think about uh, graduation. We've seen the colleges and the high schools going through that process. And we see uh, many in our own church. Uh, we have many in college and some will be going off to college. Of course, some of our seniors are getting prepared. And uh, some of those will join uh, fraternities and sororities, or maybe they won't. I don't know. But... Uh, Maybe not. It might be a good idea. But anyway, that's another discussion. But have you ever noticed that with a fraternity, when you even get into that, ed, that higher education, typically, um, you know, it's always, it's always wrapped around Greek nomenclature. You, you know, you got the, all the different uh, nomenclature for the sororities and the fraternities is, is a Greek letter or wrapped around a series of Greek letters. Uh, when you're in, you know, you get into math, engineering, and things like that, all the, a lot of your exponents are Greek. When you get into physics, uh, you, you don't, you don't say the difference is, you say the delta. You know, you use all these, you use this, these, these words and these terms that have to do with, with, you know, the Greek language and, and all of those things. And even today, Greek philosophy is still widely uh, quoted. Uh, I'm... You guys are working on it, I know. Bear with us as we work all this out. <clears throat> but even today, Greek philosophy is, is you know, noted when you think about philosophy. You know, the Greeks are, are, are where it's at. And, and even, uh, uh, you know, when we talk about the gospel and the gospel of grace, uh, we talk about our Bible. Uh, you know, outside of our English Bible, uh, we often go back in our New Testament, at any rate, to a Greek text uh, the uh, Textus Receptus, which is a Greek text. And so um, it's an interesting thing because throughout um, history, since the time of Daniel's uh, vision, when God introduced you know, the, the prince of Grecia into the equation of the Gentile powers, God has, has woven Greece into uh, the prophecy and into the structure of what God is doing among the Gentile world. So as we enter Acts chapter 17, uh, the next several weeks, I just want to take some time and, and focus on these three churches. As Paul moves from Philippi, this location that had no synagogue, it had no church, it was freshly tilled ground, uh, God moves him south to the GNC and down to Thessalonica, which we'll see this morning. And in that location, it's a key city. It's a key place of industry. It's a key place of commerce. It's a key place um, uh, for the Roman Empire and also the, touching on the Greek culture. Of course, today, modern-day Greece uh, encompasses uh, these very locations that we'll be talking about. Um, and then uh, Paul moved from there down to... Um, um, 
Berea. We'll talk about that next week and how, and the Bereans, how, how honorable they were, how educated they were. And then we are going to move down into um, Athens. Of course, Athens is the location where Paul spoke in Mars Hill, the famous message on Mars Hill. We'll be able to see that when we get to church on the park on the 2nd of June. And so, uh, so I'm going to take about three weeks to just process through what I've titled The War for Wisdom. Uh, because we know that the wisdom of God is the apex of all wisdom. It is, there is no wisdom that will stand outside of God's wisdom. But yet, the world does have its philosophies, and it does, it does have its, its mindset. And, and, uh, and, and our, our biblical mindset is often opposed. So we're going to see three things as we travel to each city. The first thing that we'll see in Thessalonica is that the word is reasonable. Paul, we'll see this morning, will reason with the Thessalonians, but he will also face political opposition. Opposition will be political. When we get to Berea, we'll see that the word is researchable. We'll see how studious these Bereans are, but we'll also see that there comes opposition that's theological. And then when we get to Athens, we'll see that the word of God is unassailable. Although uh, those gathered there will still cling, many of them, to philosophy uh, and reject the Word of God, though not all. And so it'll take the next few weeks to process all of that. But I want to just start by introduction this morning. And I, I, I want to apologize to you. This morning I did not prepare a PowerPoint. Uh, so you will not get all this in PowerPoint today. You will have to pay attention and take notes like we used to do in the old days. And so um, you can't take pictures of my slides because they're not up there. So uh, if you do want my notes, I tell you what, I will probably, pr I can produce my notes and uh, you can have those when I'm done preaching. I'll put those up online somewhere. But um, I do not have a PowerPoint this morning. So uh, by way of introduction, uh, Isaiah chapter one and verse 18 says this, and I think this will be on the screen. Come now and let us, what's it say? Reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And so I want you to know this morning, the Word of God, it's reasonable. Jesus Christ is reasonable, but many do not understand or perceive that. If you have your Bibles, let's stand together. Read the book of Acts chapter 1. We're only going to read the first nine verses this morning. We're going to pray, and we're going to look at uh, this text this morning. Acts chapter one, uh, 17 and uh, verse 1. Acts 17 and verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where was the synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and uh, three Sabbath days <clears throat> reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks a great multitude and of the chief women not a few. Verse 5, <clears throat> But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sword, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. When Jason uh, hath received all of uh, and I'm sorry, when Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to just meditate upon your word, to hear the word. I pray, God, that we would not just hear this audibly and read this visually, although those are great things, Lord. But you would open up our hearts today to the Word of God, that you would do a work in our lives today. We thank you and we praise you. We ask this, uh, not for our sakes, but for your sake, Lord, that, that you would be glorified through us and in us. Lord, that you would receive the honor, the glory, the praise. Lord, do a work in our hearts that brings honor and glory to your name. We thank you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> And so this morning, as we look at this uh, topic of the word being reasonable, the word is reasonable. Uh, there is a war over reason, isn't there? And in our culture today, it's very apparent. 
Uh, of course, there is no counsel, there is no wisdom against the Lord, at least any wisdom or counsel that will stand. But what I want to encourage us to do this morning, if you're taking notes, the first point that I want to point out to you is, is the word is reasonable. We can, we've established that, I think. The word is reasonable. The Lord himself said, come let us reason together, saith the Lord. Many would say that, you're, that Bible-believing Christians are unreasonable. Right? Anyone that would believe that the Bible is the guide of faith, that it is a guide for life, that it's a guide for truth, uh, that's unreasonable. However, you don't even have to have a Bible to look around the culture and realize that our culture is built. We would not have a law system. We would not have any, any understanding of justice and judgment at all in our culture without this very Bible that many seem to think is so unreasonable. So there is a very, this is a real deal. This is a real deal going on right now in our culture. These are very applicable things. So when you think about the word being reasonable, the word is reasonable. Our first point of study this morning, if the word is reasonable, we need to seize our opportunity to receive it. The word is reasonable, so seize the opportunity to receive it. The word is reasonable, so seize the opportunity to receive it. I think I said that three times, right? So what am I saying? Seize the opportunity to hear what I say. To hear what God says, most importantly. And when should we do that? When should we seize the opportunity to receive it? Well, number one, when it's available. When it's available. We take for granted in our country, we got the Bible, man, we got it, just go grab one, you know? Well, in a lot of places, they do, still to this day do not have the Bible. We, you, I, we need to seize the Word of God. Why? Well, because God's provided it. When it's available, in the first three verses, we saw that Paul was moving around and, and he lands in Thessalonica. But before he got to Thessalonica, right, he, he, he traveled through a few other cities. Not everybody was able to hear Paul's message. God was sending it where he wanted it to go. And to those people that received that message, they were then responsible. They then became stewards of what God was saying. So Paul went to Thessalonica because it was, well, he had some reasons. It was a chief uh, city of Macedonia. Now, if you've been paying attention, you say, well, wait a minute. Uh, I thought Philippi was a chief city of Macedonia. Well, it was, and it, is, it was at that time. So let me just give you a quick history lesson. Back in the day when uh, Macedonia, uh, about 300 B.C., Macedonia was split into four kingdoms or four sections. And there were four key cities uh, in that region. One of those was Thessalonica. Another one was Philippi. And I don't recollect the other two right now. But there were four major cities. So uh, when, uh, 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 after that dissolved and, the, and uh, the situation changed as the Roman uh, Empire developed, um, Philippi was the, the capital city of Macedonia, but Thessalonica still held a, a high place as a Roman city. And, uh, and so it was a very important city. It was a key city. It was a chief city of Macedonia. So just a historical factoid, Thessalonica means victory over falsehood. It was named after Alexander the Great's stepsister uh, who married a guy named King Cassander of Macedonia. Uh, over 300 years before Christ was born. And it was noted in history for its military aid in the, as they helped the, the Romans defeat the Phoenicians. And if you know anything about Phoenicia, that is the land that is also called Palestine. So this was a key, uh, this was a key uh, city that in history had also mil military ties to the area around the Promised Land. And the word in, at the end of Thessalonica, there's a Greek word there that you're all familiar with, and that is uh, N-I-C-A, not the N-I-C-A, but N-I-K-E as we call it today, Nike, right? Nike means victory. And so Thessalonica uh, is that same Greek word that, that concludes the word Thessalonica is where the word victory comes from. That's the why everyone has Nike all over their t-shirts and their tennis shoes and all of that if you're not boycotting them right now. But anyway, so, uh, and so that's, that's where all that comes from. Even our, even our sportswear has a Greek origin, right? And a kind of a, a subliminal hidden meaning. You know, if you're really smart, you'll know what Nike means. Um, but most of us just say, just do it. All right, so what does Nike mean? Just do it. Anyhow, so um, also though, Thessalonica was a free Roman city. Uh, so it, it, had, uh, it had some limited uh, financial and military autonomy from the Roman Empire. Uh, it was strategic in nature. It had some freedoms that not all Roman uh, cities enjoyed. Uh, and it was along a highway called the Ignatian Way. The Ignatian uh, Way was a, was a very important uh, Roman highway that provided 
um, it was about 600 miles long. It provided a lot of, a lot of uh, not information, that was before the information superhighway. But for the time of the Romans, it would have been a uh, commercial highway. It would have provided a lot of goods and services uh, throughout that region. Uh, along the Aegean Sea. So Paul is following this road, and we, we always talk about the Romans road, and there's a lot of parallels between the roads, literally, that Paul took and the gospel in the book of Romans. And so, um, and so we've also understood that Paul was going to a location and written, defaulting to his pattern of going to a Roman city that had a Jewish synagogue. And so he moves his, his he makes his way uh, down this Roman route and going to a place in Rome, uh, in now in Europe. He's now hit the European continent and he's heading to uh, the synagogue where the word of God will be taught. Now let's talk about the synagogue because that's where the word of God's available. It's, it's in Thessalonica and it's in a place as we see in the text uh, in a synagogue at the end of verse one. He passes through Amphipolis and. Uh, Apollonia, and then they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews? And so it would be here in the synagogue that God would open, uh, the, the word of God would be opened every Sunday. No, not Sunday. Every Saturday. The Sabbath day is, on, is actually Saturday. So this was not Seventh-day Adventists. These are Old Testament Jews, and they worship on the seventh day, the Sabbath day. And so they would open up the Bible, and it would be it would look very similar to what we do on the first day of the week as we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord every week. Uh, they open up the Bible. They would present it. And, uh, and so the Apostle Paul went to that location because why? The Bible is open. He wanted to go to a place where God's Word was open. And that's part of Paul's missions strategy. It was here that Paul, as, a, as his manner was, it says in verse 2, would seek an opportunity to speak as a Pharisee, right? He's a doctor of the law, as he did in Cyprus and Pamphylia in Acts chapter 13 and verse 4. In Acts 13 and verse 14, Paul was a, was a learned Jew. Even though he had become a Christian, the Jews didn't know what all that meant. And guess who could tell them? Well, the Apostle Paul. This Pharisee of Pharisees, this Hebrew of Hebrews. So as he rolls into these synagogues, he's obviously very adept at being able to function and speak to the Jews in the synagogue and do exactly what the text says further down in the text where he opens in verse 3 and alleges that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. Therein lies the message, the thrust of what the Apostle Paul was saying. And anything else that he was saying was wrapped around that thrust, what he was trying to get across to those Jews in the synagogue. So here's the application this morning, because I can see we're already getting weary of factoids. <laughs> if you desire to receive the Word of God, be in a place that honors it. I mean, if you want to hear from God, you're not going to get it out here smoking dope. You're not going to get it over here in the dojo, right? Uh, you're, going to get it, you're going to get it in the Word of God. So go to a place where people open up the Bible and honor God's Word. Amen. That's where you go. That's where you go. If you want to know where, the, where God's going to talk, where, where there's an opportunity to receive the Word of God, go to a place where people actually say, look, this is His Word, and they exalt it in its proper place. I was teaching the children this morning in the Warriors, and I got convicted because I had to have them up, one walking around, and we're trying to read. It. I stopped there. I said, wait a minute. Come and sit. Let's everybody sit down. We have the Bible open this morning, and we're reading the Word of God. This is God's Word. We just take it for granted, man. We got Bible. We got Scripture everywhere. Hey, there's a time when it was hard-pressed to find any Scripture, beloved. A lot of people have bled and died to deliver us our authorized version of the Bible. And so even though we've been a few hundred years past that, 400 years to be exact, the reality is that we need to understand that, man, what God has given us is precious. And when this book is open, God wants to speak. And if you want to hear from God, go to the place where God's Word is open. You're not going to find it at the mosque. Oh, that's, inf that's inflammatory, right? Because you can't say that. Listen, that's what the Bible claims. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You can't find it at the Mormon temple. You can't find it at the Hindu temple. But you say, Brian, and you're going to jump ahead to Athens and say, but Brian, there's all kinds of truth, not just your truth. That's called pluralism. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul was saying. There is a way, there is a truth, and there is a life, and his name is Jesus Christ. And that message is every bit as inflammatory in this pluralistic culture as it was in Paul's. 
And so if you want a safe place, if you need a safe space to find out what God's saying, you come to the right place. It's right here where the Word of God is open. And I'm not trying to rap, I promise. <laughs> so Paul will eventually, he's going, to get his, he's going to get down to Mars Hill. He's going to get down to Athens. But he preferred to start in a place that at least understood who Je Jehovah God was. Because he'll find his place in the, in the, house of, in the temple of plural, pluralism. And anything goes when the whistle blows regarding worship. But he starts in a place where the Bible's open in a synagogue. Where there's one true God who made a covenant promise with his people Israel. And Paul says, I can work with that. Because all that has been fulfilled in the man Christ Jesus. And he just starts preaching. And so when it's, uh, you, if you want to seize the opportunity to receive the Bible, <clears throat> you got to be where it's at when it's available, right? He's in Thessalonica, he's in the synagogue, and he's among those who honored the scripture. Now, now not all the houses of worship are equal. It was in the synagogue where Paul could preach uh, with understanding the scriptures, that it was the absolute authority. He wasn't going to get a bunch of push, pushback, except for maybe a few guys from Alexandria, Egypt. But for the most part, he could, he could preach the Bible that he had, his Masoretic text, and he could say, he could say, thus saith the Lord God. And then he could have side conversations with those other guys from Alexandria. And so, and so Paul had this absolute authority. So if you want to receive truth, you need to be in a place that honors God's word. Now Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And he told us in John 17, 17, that's how we are sanctified. That's how he sets us apart, right? He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now, when he said that, he was actually praying to the Father. And he was praying to the Father in regards to us, his disciples. He says, Father, when I leave this earth, would you set apart, would you sanctify the disciples, the men that I've invested in? Would you do that? How I, Father, I'm going to ask that you do that through any old truth in the world. No. Through thy truth, right? Thy truth, thy word is truth. Set them apart, Lord. And God's answering that prayer literally. As the Apostle Paul is moving about like a special forces agent with the knife in his mouth from location to location, just, just changing everything as he goes. I mean, it's like, it's crazier than a Hollywood movie. How can one man, how can a couple guys, how can a small team, I mean, they're like, they're like the best special forces for God you've ever seen. Everywhere they go, man, I mean, God is just blessing them, and, and the message is just being magnified. Why? Because, well, it's not their message. They had the boldness. This is the DNA that God has created our church with. This is the DNA that God has given the local New Testament church, the Bible-believing local New Testament church, that we are actually willing and crazy enough to love God and to love this book enough to stand on it, to believe it, and even to preach it and proclaim it, even when you're in a pluralistic world that rejects you and it. Paul is like, I'll take that challenge because I know me, and I'm the chief of sinners. And I've been on both sides of this thing, and I've decided to choose Christ, and you need to choose him too. Paul knew this was a labor of love. Because God loved him, he was willing to love others. And he was willing to share, and he was willing to take a stand, and a beating if necessary. And what we're going to find here as we continue through the text are so those others that were sanctified through the word in, in Thessalonica. Now we also will find this among the believers. Just kind of skip down to verse 4. And I'm going to skip back around here, back and forth this morning. So you'll have to stay with me. But in verse 4 it says, And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. And so if you want to find the word, right? If you want to know where the word's at, if you want it revealed to you, right? You need to be in a place where, where people believe. It says some believed. You, mean, you need to be among uh, those who believe the Scripture. Not just in a, in a, in a city, not just in a synagogue, not, in, not just where the Bible's open, but you need to find people, actually literal people, that actually believe the Bible. Because, believe it or not, the Apostle Paul preached, but not everybody was buying what Jesus Christ had purchased. Right? Not everybody was willing to receive the gift of eternal life that Jesus Christ had bought. You thought I was going to say buying what he was selling. See, he wasn't selling anything. And therein lies the problem. Everybody wants to work their way to heaven, even today. Everybody wants to have some hurdle to jump through. Everybody wants something. When this guy rolls into town, he starts preaching the grace of God, that the finished work of Christ is enough, and that the law is fulfilled in one man, and that man is Christ, and that man is God manifest in the flesh. Whoa, dude, you're messing up our religious system. 
I mean, how are we going to how are we going to put people through college at 100,000 bucks a year? I mean, what are you going to Hey, stop that. I mean, we need people's money. This is a great liberating message. Some some who heard the word of God were convinced in their heart, and they believed what God was saying concerning who Jesus Christ was. I'll circle back around to that a little bit deeper here in a little bit, so hang on to that thought. But also, the Bible tells us faith comes by hearing, right? And hearing by the Word of God. We all understand that. So Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, and he told them in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, that guys, when you receive the Word of God, you didn't just sit there with your, on your hands. I mean, you received the Word of God. He said in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye, the Thessalonians, received the Word of God, <clears throat> which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the Word of men. You see, some, even this morning, as you listen to me, that's what you're hearing. You're hearing some dude named Brian who has nothing to say other than what God has to say. Right? I don't have anything of value to offer. But... Paul was preaching the Word of God, but I am preaching the Word of God. What really matters here is what the Lord says, Thus saith the Lord God. And that comes with power. That comes with authority. That comes as, as, as what Paul says here. When you heard the Word of God, you received it not as the Word of man, but as it is in truth. There is truth. And it is the Word of God. Our relativistic culture will not, not abide with that. That there is an absolute truth? Yes! There is a final authority. And even if you don't believe it, you will stand before Him. Even if you don't believe it, He will return in judgment. And even if you will believe it, then He will receive you now. I'll tell you what, beloved, this is not a lot different in this century than it was in the first. But as it is in truth, the Word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So stealing from James, right? He's saying, man, when you guys heard the Word of God. You weren't just hearers of the Word. You became doers of the Word. Man, it had an impact in your life. There was a change of heart. There was a change of mind that produced a change of life, and it affected you. You became effectually changed by what the truth of God's Word said. And it changed the way you lived. It changed the way you thought. It changed the way your life was functioning. How many of you have that testimony this morning? Amen. Amen. I hope you do. And if you don't, that'll tell you something about where you're at in hearing and really receiving the Word of God as it is in truth, the words of God. Just because I raise my voice does not make it any more true. Just because I'm passionate about it in my life doesn't mean you're passionate about it at all. I'll just, like one preacher said, I'll just set myself on fire and you can watch me burn, but that doesn't make you burn. It has to happen in the heart. Your heart has to burn. Your heart has to open up. And you have to receive, as it is in truth, the very words of God. Amen. I'm glad I did. Because I've also rejected the very words of God. So I'm chief of sinners too. So if you, were, if you really want to receive it, man, you also need to be among those who consort with the apostles. I mean, I, I, if you haven't noticed, I'm just ratcheting this baby up every step of the way, right? You're in the right place. Thanks for coming to Harrisonville. You're in the right house. Thank you for coming to Heartland. Hey, you're in the right book, man. This is the word of truth. But are you with the disciples? Or are you just checking in and checking out? Uh-oh, now, Brian, you just quit preaching and went to meddling. Because in verse 4, that's what it says. They consorted with Paul and Silas. They consorted... The some were the Jews whom Paul preached to first, by the way. There's another reason he went to the synagogue. And in Romans, he gives us a really good outline of that. So I, I've, I've got three verses that will be coming across the screen. We don't have time to look them all up. I wish we did, but for time's sake, I'm just going to read them off. The first one's in Romans 1.16. And the Apostle Paul, of course, Romans 16 is the doctrinal thesis for our... I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. So Romans chapter 1 is, is their doctrinal thesis for the New Testament. And so Paul just kind of gives a little doctrinal thesis on, hey, why is it that I go to, the Jews, go to the Jews first? And the first thing he says is in Romans 1.16. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. That's the first reason. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. He makes it clear. It's, it's to everybody that believeth. And then he says, to the Jew first. And also the Greek. And the Greek there obviously doesn't just mean the Grecians. He's, he's referring to the world. Because, uh, the, 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 again, the educational system at that time of the world, though it was a Roman military empire, imperialist empire, 
it was a Greek educational philosophy, as it is today. And uh, the Jews were, they, they were the priority because under them were committed the oracles of God. It gives us a little more detail in Romans 3, 2. I don't have time to get into all that this morning, but we'll get into, we've been into that when we're in Romans. Go back and listen online to my messages on Romans 9 through 11. But he, to, to God had given Israel a special place and promises. And actually what Paul was doing as he went from city to city, synagogue to synagogue, was still offering to Israel the gospel. Uh, it was offered in Jerusalem. It was offered in Judea. It was offer, offered in Samaria. And now Paul is going to the uttermost parts of the earth, offering it again to the Jews first. And also the Greeks, because it's for all. You say, well, Brian, that don't, that's not fair. Well, actually it's absolutely fair, because Jesus came to his own. Jesus is Jewish. His covenant promises were with Abraham's seed. That seed happens to be through Jacob and the twelve tribes. And the kingdom of heaven promises that Jesus himself promised uh, in the Beatitudes are going to be granted yet future to the nation of Israel. So it's absolutely the right thing to do. And so God doesn't like put his finger up in the air to feel which way the wind's going. He's the one driving the boat. And that's the way he designed it. Okay? But it's for everybody. So this is what happens. Uh, Romans chapter 2 and verse 8. The next passage, as, we, as we're walking through Romans Road, um, is, uh, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth. Oh, yeah, what about them? What about those guys in Thessalonica that heard Paul preach and then said, you know, Paul, uh, you can go take a hike, pal. Uh, we're going to stick with what we've always known. And this Jesus guy, he's not for us. Well, uh, Paul answers that in Romans 2.8. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, uh, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that, do, that doeth evil <clears throat> of the Jew first and also of a little broader gent and the Gentile. So there's also a judgment to those who hear the gospel and do not receive it. Notice in verse 1 and 2, Paul, how many weeks did he stay in that synagogue preaching? Three weeks. Three weeks. Why? Because Paul was giving them opportunity to hear and receive the gospel. I'll speak to that a little further in a moment. Romans chapter 2 and verse 10, as we're still in that same chapter, it goes on to say, but, right? Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Well, to show us the contrast between verses 8 and 9. And so it says, but glory, honor, and peace to every man, every man, every man, every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also the Greek. For there's no respect of persons with God. Just in case you want to accuse God of being a respecter of persons, uh, Paul says, no, no. He just does things decently and in order. God is not a respecter of persons. He will give his truth to anyone, Jew or Gentile, that will receive it. But his inheritance is, it gets a little bit different. Anytime, anytime you want to give an inheritance, I just want you to know this. If you're a parent or a grandparent or a great-grandparent and you're sitting on enough assets that you want to give those as an inheritance, I just got news for you. You can be as unfair as you choose to be. The judgment of how that inheritance is distributed is solely upon you and how you decide to conduct it. And I tell you what, before you start pointing fingers back at God, uh, just understand this one thing. God has decided that he has decided to give all, every, every man everywhere every opportunity to repent and receive the grace of God. Because he's a very loving and, bene and, ben and a benevolent God. He's a good God. The fact that the Jews do hold a, 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 a primary place in regard to promises related to the kingdom of heaven just again shows God's graciousness. Because he didn't limit all of us from the kingdom of God because of that. So... Um, I got ahead of myself, which I probably need to do. But anyway, <clears throat> and so in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Bible tells us that the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want anyone to die and go to hell. So he's not saying that. In Matthew 11, in verse 28, Jesus himself said, Come unto me, come unto me all ye that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And then Paul goes on to write in Romans to the, regarding his, his brother in Israel, and he says in verse 8 of chapter 10, But what saith it? The word is nigh, right? That's near. It's, it's nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. 
When Paul was in a synagogue, he probably said those very words, quoting from the Old Testament, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You say, well, Brian, why do we use that with Gentiles when he was, he was also addressing the Jews in Romans chapter 10? Because it is for all. That was exactly the issue. When Paul was in Thessalonica, that's what he was presenting. That all men everywhere can be saved. How's that? Through this man, Christ Jesus. And he says in verse 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. You say, well, Paul, it's that easy? I mean, we're supposed to keep the law of Moses. And he says, well, but the Scripture saith, the Scripture saith, the Scripture saith, the Scripture saith, whosoever believeth upon him shall not be ashamed. And so Paul made his case. And the gospel was first preached to the Jews. But a great multitude, it says, of devout Greeks, including chief women, believed and followed Paul and Silas like the disciples followed Jesus. Not all the Jews would follow. Some would. Praise the Lord for them. But man, those Greeks that were listening, they were devout Greeks. And you know what? They were, they, were, <clears throat> they were not born into the covenant promise of Israel. They were strangers from the commonwealth of Israel. They were strangers, but yet they heard this word. They heard that book opened, and they heard that message go forth. And, and there was something about the truth of God's word. These were educated people. They understood that the system that had been developed... Uh, throughout time that God had given to the nation of Israel, these, these Jews that had been dispersed and were oftentimes educating their, their children and being the, the chief tutors in their homes. They had some, some sort of knowledge, some sort of wisdom that was from above. And that, that, that wisdom that came to them as it did to Solomon changed their homes and it changed their lives as they, as they honored and they magnified this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then this man, the Apostle Paul, rolls into the synagogue and these Jewish or these Greeks are listening to this message and all of a sudden what they hear is simply this. You are welcome to enter the kingdom right now through this man Christ Jesus. Woohoo! They're excited. You mean I don't have to join the church? No, you join Jesus and you get in the church. I mean, he just preaches it to them and he lays it out for them and it's just grace. Oh, they hadn't heard anything like it and there's absolute truth and there's an absolute man and it, it, it isn't Caesar. And it isn't Thor. It's Jesus. So let me give you a quick... Oh, by the way, and the chief women. People, they always say, you know, you're a Bible believer, you hate women. If you, if you paid careful attention to the New Testament, Paul was countercultural in, in the way he dealt with women. He gave them way more authority, way more reference, way more deference than the culture at that time than the culture in, in the Middle East at this time, by the way. <clears throat> Where does that come from? It comes from the grace of God. It comes from the New Testament. Not the Old Testament, the New Testament. But anyway, that's another message. It's not in my notes. So let me give you a, a hermeneutical factoid. That's a big word to make you really impressed. Uh, let me give you a Bible study tip here. A little factoid of Bible study. Luke only uses this word consort here in Acts 17.4 7, throughout the whole New Testament. Um, it comes from a Greek word that means associate with, which we, we could know that because that's what it means in English today, right? So what's the big deal? Well, here's the application. Just to, I want to give you some application so you can walk out of here today with something you can use. Because, <clears throat> you know, we need to receive the word when it's available. And we often wonder, well, who received it and who didn't? Well, I'll tell you a good indication is the people you consort with. The people that you make yourself available to. The people that you walk with. You'll notice these folks followed the apostles. They, they followed them like they followed Jesus. And in Acts chapter 16, we just read it a few weeks ago, there was a woman, right, that, that had a devil. She followed the apostles and she said all the right things. She was talking about the Most High God. She was talking about these are the servants of the Most High God. And you remember that. Paul was grieved when he heard all of that. Not because she was not saying the truth, but because she didn't honor the absolute authority. But you know what was really interesting in her life? The Bible is also very clear that that lady, until she was released uh, through the power of God, through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, she consorted with evil men. She was available to people who were using her. She was available to people who were manipulating her. She was available to people that didn't have her interest in mind, that only used her for money. Well, I've seen that. I've been at the... You know, when I preach it, I'm going to be crude here for just a moment, but let me be blunt. When I preached at the City Union Mission, a lot of times there was a phrase called Mother's Day. 
And there were crude men, men of the baser sort. You know what they did? They found the woman they wanted on the day they wanted because they knew her welfare check was coming in. And they called it Mother's Day. What were they doing? They, they were, and you know what? A lot of these guys would say, I'm with Jesus. I'd say, I think you're with the devil. I don't care what you're telling me. See, the human nature is nasty. It needs redeemed. And so we have a woman who, was, who had a devil following the apostles, saying the right things, but associating with evil and wicked men who only used her for gain. But in Acts chapter 17 and verse 4, we see believers, I mean, people who are changed in their core, as we've already read in Philippians, or 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13, who, who changed their association uh, to follow the servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. They said, you know what, Paul and Silas, you can come in my house. You can hang out with us. You can see where we live. We want to be with you. And guess what? Paul and Silas wanted to be with them. They wanted to be together. They wanted to associate with one another. They wanted to consort together. And let me just tell you this. Who you associate with or you consort with, not just who you verbally endorse, often indicates a great deal about who you're really following. And I know this to be a fact. In the business world, I worked with men that, man, they'd even, they'd go to church on Sunday, but from, you know, Monday through Saturday night at midnight, I tell you what, brethren, all they consorted with was the evil men of this world. They walk like them, they talk like them, they act like them. And then they could say, amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah, they were shams. Right. Makes me sick. I'm not saying every day that I walked in the spirit at work. I had bad days. And I, I regret that. I've, I, there's, some just, there's things I did at work that, man, I, I still look back and I go, man, I wish I wouldn't have said that. I wish I wouldn't have done that. So I'm going to give you all grace because I've got to have grace. I'm gracious. But I'm telling you this. If you, if you believe the Lord Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and then you go to work every week and you act like a lost man, would you stop it or get saved? Because if you're saved, you can walk in the Spirit. You don't have to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Grow up, put on your big boy pants, take a few shots in the mouth if somebody doesn't like it. Be a man and stand for Jesus, for goodness sake. I just, I tell you what, I don't even understand it. God places us in this world and we must love, honor, and associate with the lost. We care about lost people. We're not going to win them if we don't say, look, the Word of God has sanctified my life. I have put my heart in Jesus, and I just can't go smoke dope anymore with you, man. I can't go get wasted after work anymore. i got a wife and kids, and Jesus has changed me, for goodness sake. No, I'm not going to buy meth anymore. No, I'm not going to get a hold of your dope. I'm not going to go steal anymore. I No, I'm not going to lie anymore. I know Jesus. I'm just saying, beloved, receive the Word of God when it's available. It changes your life. My timer says goose eggs. That's not good. Does it go backwards, Randy? <laughs> I'll be, I'll be, I'll be quick, quick. This is the second point. <laughs> <laughs> For the children's sake, seriously, I, I'm really concerned about the children's workers. So, hey, listen, second point. So first point was receive the word of God when it's available, right? It's reasonable. Paul reasoned with them. Secondly, receive the word of God when it is preached. You say, well, that sounds a lot like what I just said. I know it does, but I want to just drill down just a little deeper and then we'll be done. The Word of God is, is reasonable. We see that in verse 2. That's why Paul opened, right? And he, he reasoned with them. He opened and alleged, the Bible says. He reasoned in verse, at the end of verse uh, uh, <clears throat> 2. It says he spent those three Sabbath days reason, and he reasoned with them, notice specifically, out of the Scriptures. It wasn't philosophy. It wasn't what he thought about the Bible. He was actually showing them in the Bible. This is, thus saith the Lord. This is what the Bible preaches. This is what the Bible teaches. And so again, just to reiterate our introduction verse in Isaiah, the Bible's reasonable. The word translated as reasonable is also translated as disputed, preached, and speaketh. But the scripture settles our disputes. It empowers our preaching and it enlightens our speech. So the word of God, it's, it's, it's available. It's available. The Word of God is available. Uh, in Acts chapter 17 and verse 2, it's found in the pages of this book. 
And if we want to receive the Word of God, you can do that while you can. In Acts chapter 17, verses 2 through 3, Paul gave uh, them every opportunity he could to, to afford to receive Christ as their Messiah. He wasn't quick. He didn't just come into the synagogue and say, Hey, I'm going to send you to hell right now. I'm going to, you know, you, you, pre, you receive this message or it, right? He came back three weeks. Why? Because he understood. He, he had so much time. He had so much life to live. But he wanted to give them every opportunity to succeed. He afforded them an opportunity to listen, to think, to ask questions, and to make a decision. But also, he couldn't stay there forever. And God wouldn't allow that, even if he wanted to. So Paul followed the pattern of three witnesses. I told you I would get to this, and I will. In Matthew 18, 16, the Bible says, But if, if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two. Uh, talking about witnesses. Then the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Right? We need to establish uh, that, you know what? You've got the 66 books. I'm going to give you three opportunities. And then after that, I've got to move on. I'm going to move on to the church of Jason's house. I'm going to move on to the fellowship of those Greeks and, and, uh, and chief women. I'm going to move on to those Jews that receive the word of God. I don't leave your synagogue alone. You don't want me here anymore? I'm going to move. And uh, in 2 Corinthians 13, 1, this is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. If the Apostle Paul comes to you and says, listen, I've told you guys already and start saying something like that, you better pay attention because uh, after that comes a judgment. In Titus 3.10, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, what do you do on the third? Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You reject him. I like that better. Bye. I like that. Bye. You're out. You know, you get three strikes. We even use that in baseball. Man, it's divine. So you're out. So seize the opportunity to receive it when it's available and when it's preached. And then also... Stand strong in the face of unreasonable opposition. And that's the last thing that we see in verses 5 through 9. And just quickly, I want to look at that one more time. It's been a few minutes. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy and took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sword and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. So they go after Jason. And uh, we don't know Jason until this moment, but God introduces him by name. I think he was a special man. The gospel is only good news to those who receive it. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, I used to get annoyed with the gospel when I was lost too. I know what it's like. I remember poor Alex Jamie's tried to witness, gave me a chick track when I was a 10-year-old, and I just berated him. And I look back on that, I'm like, that was just Satan working in me. I don't know why I was so angry with that kid. All he was wanting to do is show me the gospel. You know, I was lost. Well, guess what? The folks in Thessalonica were lost. And uh, it, it was need, needful that they stood strong. Because we gotta, if, the, if the word is reasonable, we've got to stand strong in the face of unreasonable opposition. If the word is reasonable, we've got to stand strong in the face of unreasonable opposition. Right? There, there's <clears throat> uh, we've got to seize the opportunity to receive it when it's available, when it's preached. But we've also got to stand strong in the face of unreasonable opposition. So the gospel is only, is only good to those who receive it. In verses 17, chapter 17, verse 3, when Paul said he was opening and alleging, there's a lot of meaning in that. It's, it is the message that caused the problems for Jason. The fact that Paul would dare equate Jesus as Messiah offended so many people, not only in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, but in the uttermost parts of the earth. That word opening is translated from the Greek word, uh, which is also translated opened, openeth, or opening. It's only found eight times in the New Testament. And it's interesting because when you look it up, it's found in Mark 7, 34 through 35, in Luke chapter 24, verses 31 through 32, and Luke 24, 5, and Acts 16 and verse 14. That's the only verses in the Bible that it's mentioned. So each mention refers to the supernatural power of this certain word, open. It's a Greek word, which I'm not going to get into what it says and all that because I don't need to impress you with it, nor do we read it. But the point is simply this. There's some power behind the opening of the Word of God and then the opening of people's hearts. And so when it says that he was opening and alleging, he wasn't just opening up the Bible physically, but God was using it to open supernaturally people's hearts. The first time you see that word opening, that same word used in Mark 7, 34 through 35, Jesus is actually, it says, opening a deaf man's ears. He's opening his ears supernaturally, and the guy all of a sudden can hear. And the next time you see it's in Mark 7, 34 through 35. And Jesus is opening the eyes, literally, of a blind man. And he can see, miraculously. 
The next time you see that word used uh, is further on in Luke chapter 24 and verse 45. And it's Jesus speaking about his own words to, his own, to the disciples and talking about opening up, not their eyes, not their ears, but their understanding, their heart to receive, to hear the Word of God. And what I found so interesting about that is you don't see that word again until you get to Acts chapter 16 and verse 14. And you wouldn't be surprised to know that when we see Acts chapter 16 and verse 14, the verse that we've already covered last week, it's a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple in the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God. You know what it says? She heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she was attending unto the things which were spoken of Paul. It could be me this morning that God has brought you here and you thought you were just going to hear some guy get up here and talk about the Bible. Well, what actually happened is the Bible started talking to you. Amen. And the God starts to open up your heart. That's supernatural. That is divine. You want to let God have his work. Maybe God needs you this morning to receive the truth of God's word. Maybe you're like some of those Jews. Maybe this is your last chance. Maybe you've, you've been to the synagogue a couple times. You've been to the place. You've heard the message, but you haven't really opened your heart to receive it. But God has opened in your heart to receive it. I would encourage you today to follow the Lord's leading. As he was also alleging. He was opening and alleging. He was setting it forth. In Mark 6, 41, as Jesus is feeding the 5,000, he gives that bread. And it literally says he, he, he handed it. Uh, he, he set it forth. He, he, put, he gave it to him and he, and he says, here, I'm going to set the bread forth. He just put it out there for him. God wants to, he, he says, hey guys, here it is. You can take it. You can't make anyone get saved. It, ultimately, everyone has to make a decision to receive what God has given. It's a personal decision. So stand strong when unreasonable believers are moved in envy against you. We see very clearly that that's exactly what happened. They were envious. The text says so. It wasn't anything Jason did. They just were envious of, the, of, of this message. The scripture is clear that, that, that God wanted the Jews to believe and move close to him through Christ and come to know him. But the opposite occurred as they rejected the message. So what are they really envious of? They're envious of grace. They want to earn their way to heaven. They want to reject the way of Christ because they want to be the gatekeepers. They don't want to give over their keys to receive his. They're proud and they don't want to acknowledge that they have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And they want to keep others below them. And I'm talking about the Jews in particular. That's called self-righteousness. And there's many a man and many a woman today in our pluralistic culture that will die of self-righteousness. Not because they're, they have the law of Moses that they're so much adhering to, but because they have the law of their own conscience. And they have their way instead of God's way. And they won't yield to the truth of God's word, to God's way, to God's life. So don't allow envy of the lost to keep you from proclaiming the gospel. There's a strange thing that's happened in the church in the last 20 years. And for some reason, all of a sudden, the church has got exceedingly concerned about what lost people think about us. And beloved, I think it's very important that we love people, period. I don't care where they come from. I think we demonstrate that as much as we can at this church. And I'm about all things to all men that by all means you may save some. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, our primary concern as Christians in the church has to be about the one who bought us. That's who we're here to please. That's who died. That's who we're here to focus on. So stand strong when unreasonable unbelievers turn the mob against you. Because that's what happened to Jason. Jason, next thing you know, they say, hey, is Saul there? Or is Paul there? Is Silas there? Well, I'll tell you what. You're guilty because you consort with them. You're guilty because you associate with them. When reason becomes unreasonable, <laughs> the Jews recruit the mob to do the dirty work. So there's nothing new under the sun, is there? Saul Alinsky tactics, right? The old George Soros guy, Karl Marx, Lenin's Bolsheviks, whatever you want to call it. There's, it's happened over and over and over again throughout history. And it happened in the first century. We can't stop these guys' message biblically. It's so reasonable, so what can we do? Oh, let's try politics. I can pay a guy here that knows a guy there, and we got an organization here. I'll tell you what, we can take care of this, pal. Just a few bucks. And they got the mob that says the whole city was on an uproar. I mean, it was on talk radio, it was on social media, it was on the internet, everybody was. And I'll tell you what, Paul was a dirty dog. And Silas was a horrible guy. And that guy, Jason, and anybody that would dare associate with those crazy fanatic fundamentalists are nuts. 
But you know what? You've got to stand strong when unreasonable unbelievers assault you. Because it wasn't just putting circles around their house and getting the media on them. Before you know it, before you know it, man, they're coming after them physically. And they're assaulting them, it says. Then they drag them off to court and they tie them up in court like Sanballat and Tobiah did to Nehemiah. Why did they do that? Because the devil knew he could try to stop this. He wanted to stop what God was doing. He'd already seen what happened in Philippi. We cannot let this happen in Thessalonica. And it wasn't really Jason they were looking for. It was Paul and Silas. No worries. You're only guilty by association. Friends, most people watching this message right now in places that this is so real to them. And when we roll into town, our big, us big shot Americans with our big shot money and our big shot airline tickets and we come to their little towns, man, they treat us with honor and respect. But I tell you what, when we leave, the culture hates them because they identify with Christ. Stand strong when unreasonable, unbelieving, and we don't have to worry about that, do we? At least not yet. Stand strong when unreasonable unbelievers bring false allegations. In verse 6, I love this. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. <clears throat> These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also? Paul and Silas didn't come to town to turn the world upside down. They came to make it right side up. Adam turned it upside down. It's been upside down ever since. Man, when Paul came to town, he's like, hey, Jesus is here to turn what was wrong right. These guys missed that. Standing strong, though, when unreasonable unbelievers use truth to discredit you. Notice what they say, though. He keeps on saying this. He's, after that statement, he says, These that have turned the world upside down have come hither also. And then verse 7, Whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar. That's not true. They're obeying the law, saying that there is, is another king. That's true. So it's a half-truth. One Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and the others, they let them go. you got to stand strong when unreasonable unbelievers use truth to discredit you. The good news is the mob at least understood or at least acknowledged the reality of Christ's authority. Hey, this, this message says that there is a higher authority than Caesar. What are you going to do about it, magistrates? Because they understood what that meant. The magistrates were like, whoa, 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 whoa. We don't want it being known in Rome that we got anything going on here that's overturning Caesar. What do we got to do here? Jason, I'm telling you what. You pay us money. If these guys come back to town, you got to turn them over. We're not going to have that here. They leverage them. <clears throat> But I just want to say this to those that might feel like that about the gospel. Because there are some that feel like that right now. They're so angry against the gospel of grace. It's just unbelievable vitriol. I mean, just craziness. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, and put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And Proverbs 17.15 says, He that justifieth the wicked... And he that condemneth the just, even they both, even they both are abominable to the Lord. If you're a magistrate and you're, and you're thinking about turning on God because of the pressure of the mob, you need to think twice. I don't think anyone in here is, so I'm talking to the atmosphere. Satan has actively been working through religious oppression from 300 A.D. till 1500 when Gutenberg's press was released. And you know what he was trying to do? He was trying to put this book away. And he tried to hide it among false religious systems that would not let people have access to the truth of God's word. That's a fact of history. So 400, 500 years later, <clears throat> where are we at? We got Bibles everywhere. The devils went about to corrupt the pure word of God. In 1900, he started hard at it. With the false Greek text, by the way, I might add. So it's approved by all the scholars from Alexandria. But there's more to it than that. There's more to it than that. Satan's also trying to use God's word against him. And it's a bad strategy. This is bad for the guys in Thessalonica. It's bad for anyone that would do that today. So we should stand strong when unreasonable unbelievers use your faith in Christ to extort money from you. 
because that'll happen too. Ultimately, they penalize Jason and the other companion who's not mentioned financially to quell the crowd, leverage him, and make sure that Paul and Silas would be put at bay. And you know what impact that had on the gospel in Thessalonica? Absolutely none. So in closing, the word is reasonable, so seize the opportunity to receive it. So stand strong in the face of unreasoned opposition. And then lastly, let me ask you, what happened to the church at Thessalonica? That's a good question. Paul couldn't go back anymore. And because of that, you know what he did? He started writing epistles. And their rejection of the scripture, that's very similar to what you see in Jeremiah when the king rejects the scripture from Jeremiah. (laughs) started the production of our New Testament, documenting the grace of God and the very messages and clarifying what Paul was preaching. And today, one of the first epistles written in your New Testament, guess what it was? This epistle written to the Thessalonians. Why? Because when they were trying to stop Paul, God was just opening another avenue to get the word where it needs to go on time. And beloved, if you don't think this church is about that, that's what we're all about. We will face opposition from time to time, but we will continue to go forward And the Apostle Paul said this about them in his first epistle, in his introductory letter. This is what he says about all that had gone on here in Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. He says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. Why would they need assurance? (laughs) Because of all the pressure they were under. As you know, what manner of men we were among you for your sake... I mean, these guys showed up with scars on their back from Philippi, right? From the Philippian jailer. He says, uh, And ye became followers of us and the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, Jason, I put that in there, with joy the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith got, uh, to God were to spread abroad so that, you need not, so that we, Paul, need not speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And then he tells them this in verse 10. He says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath of come to come. The worst thing you got to worry about, Jason, is what's right in front of you because it gets a lot better from here. When they drag you out of the city and beat you and stone you as they've done me, and then they've done Silas or whatever they're going to do to you, that's as bad as it's going to get. From there on, it's glory. So endure hardness as a good soldier. It's, it's reasonable to stand in this unreasonable world. You know why? Because Romans chapter 8 tells us, if God be with us, if God be with us, who can be against us? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the opportunity just to meditate upon this incredible...